This is the Marketing Umbrella Podcast, where it's all about getting the information you need from successful leading marketers to build and grow your digital marketing agency. Brought to you by Inamur Shafir, founder and CEO of Umbrella, the technology platform and brand that is powering thousands of marketing agencies around the country. Find him at UmbrellaUS.com. And now, here's your host, Inamar Shafir. Hi, and welcome to the Umbrella Marketing Podcast, where we talk with successful marketing experts about ways to build and grow digital marketing agencies. My guest today is considered to be the founder of the worldwide growth hacking movement. He developed and applied growth hacking at companies like Dropbox, Eventbrite, LogMeIn, and Lookout, which led to break, breakout growth for these companies. All worth billions of dollars today. And he's going to tell us how, how we started the beginning there. I'm excited to say hello to Mr. Sean Ellis. Thank you, Edamar. I'm, I'm excited to be on with you. Sean, first question, what is growth hacking? So growth hacking, anyone who's been doing marketing knows the growth hacking process, which is essentially experimenting with data and uh, using data to experiment and figure out ways to accelerate growth. Probably the difference that uh, most people who are effectively doing online marketing is that you're applying it to really all of the growth levers. So it's going beyond simply, um, you know, a, a new channel or new creative within that channel. It's, it's going all the way down to how do I onboard new customers into a product? How do I drive retention? How do I, how do I improve referral? Um, all of those things can be through, improved through experimentation and data. And so that's, that's really growth hacking in a nutshell. And, and you've been doing this in, the, in, in many companies for many years. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about your background and uh, all the companies you, you, you helped sure. grow? Yeah, sure. So when I, um, when I started kind of in growth and marketing, it was just kind of at the dawn of the internet. So mid nineties, uh, company that was in the gaming space, we, we actually started it out of Budapest, Hungary and, um, and, you know, didn't, didn't raise a lot of capital. Um, and so we were competing against some really big companies like, uh, Sony at the time was the number one advertiser on the internet. They were also leveraging their uh, television game shows like uh, Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune to promote their site. And so they held the kind of number one spot in games. And then we had a number of Silicon Valley heavily funded startups. Microsoft was competing. Wow. Yahoo was competing. And we beat them all. So um, we basically, we started with, with, you know, not a ton of resources, but some really creative experiment driven ways of growing the business that started with me really saying, okay, what's our competitive advantage? We have, um, we have super good developers. And so the first thing let's do is let's, let's build some really good tracking. So we understand exactly what's working and what's not working. And then let's try to figure out instead of just trying to go punch for punch, dollar for dollar with the other uh, companies that are much richer than us, let's figure out how can we use our development resources to actually drive a growth engine for the business. So we, we made embeddable games on third-party websites that started the game and play experience on those websites, spread virally between those websites. So uh, spread to you know, 40,000 other websites, including big ones like CNN and, and CBS Sportsline. And then uh, people would start that gameplay experience as a single player game. And then they would come to our website, which was uproar.com and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and play multiplayer games. And so um, using that approach, we were able to build the company to a top 10 website in the world and the number one in the, in the game space. And so that was kind of my first foray into, into, what later I, I started calling growth hacking. Um, but same people, same group of people who started that company, we sold that to Vivendi Universal. Uh, same group of people then started Log Me In again out of Budapest, Hungary. Mm. And um, I, I continued to run marketing from customer zero at Log Me In through uh, NASDAQ filing. And then uh, soon after leaving, Log me in. And so our big kind of pioneering thing at Log me in was we were probably one of the first SaaS businesses that uh, introduced the freemium model. So having a free version of our product and a paid version of our product, hmm. not just a trial, but a, a, a fully functional free version um, was, was key to building that business up. So it was at okay. about a hundred million active uh, 
active devices with the log me in software on it when when i left and so um you know a few months after i left log me in i joined uh, the dropbox team so pretty pretty early there um, less than 10 people and uh and what one of the things when i went into dropbox i realized that a, a lot of the um, most important contributions i'd made in log me in and uproar was in the first six months of those businesses. So kind of figuring out what would be that, that one really effective growth channel. Mm, yeah. And, um, and so then, then I ended up staying at those companies for another you know, four or five years after that. And, uh, and so I thought if I could, you know, the most important part was the first kind of six months of go to market. I only have done that twice in a 10 year period. I, I, if I want to get good at it, I'm going to need to do a lot more cycles, a lot more frequently. So then I started just doing first six months at companies. So that's when I did Dropbox uh, and then um, Eventbrite, a company called Lookout uh, after, after those two. Um, Lookout actually went on to, to be a billion dollar plus company as well. So I had a really nice. kind of lucky track record in the beginning where, um, you know, Five of the first six ones that I worked on um, got to billion dollar valuations from from kind of cust very early customers when I when I went in. You know, they may have been in private beta, but it was not, they weren't kind of in scale mode. And so um, then I decided I was get, you know, after after working with several more companies, I decided I would uh, I wanted to to be a founder and and CEO of my own company. So I, I launched a couple of businesses and sold those companies and um, and then, so that one, one was a consumer insights business called uh, Qualaroo. And mm. so you may have seen that around the web. It's a, it's, it's a pretty popular way of, of getting kind of feedback in real time while someone's using your product and kind of targeting on the behavior of them to, to get that feedback. And then, uh, and then the other company is growthhackers.com, which uh, sold a couple of years ago. And Along the way, I also wrote a book called Hacking Growth, um, and just trying to kind of document a lot of the things that um, that I was I was doing to to grow these businesses. And good, uh, so you're yeah. staying you you stay busy. <laughs> yeah, stay, I stay busy. busy, and and that kind of takes me to where I am today. <laughs> so okay, so all the companies that you mentioned, uh, if if I heard correctly, even though they started small, many times that you went into them, uh, they are mainly technology companies. Um, yeah. All of them were technology companies. So, oh. so I mean, that's that's the, really with with growth hacking, you know, it, you, you have two big advantages when it's when it's a digital experience. You know, one is that you you can get a lot more data about the actual behavior of what people are doing, and and then the the other is that you can run tests to improve that behavior, and so right. you know, or to to in, incentivize the behavior that you want to, uh, or to compel the behavior that you want to to drive, and and then when things aren't working, like people kind of giving up on the product too quickly, trying to try to cure that behavior, or um, at least kind of figure out why that's happening, run some experiments and improve that. So, so. If, if I want to take growth hacking into small marketing agencies, right? The listeners right now are small marketing agencies. Some of them are one person operations. Some of them are 20 people. They're thinking of growth hacking for themselves. They're thinking of growth hacking potentially for their clients. Right. Um, is there some, some sort of methodology that they can use even to implement that on a service business, essentially, which is digital marketing is maybe a digital experience in on, on the advertising and in marketing side, right. because everything is digital in digital marketing, but the actual ser the product behind it could be me marketing my marketing expertise or me sure. marketing a lawyer that does, uh, you know, a diverse attorney uh, right. or whatever. Is there a methodology to also growth hack these types of companies? Yeah, I think that the principles apply. The, the process is going to be a bit different. So, so the principles of essentially, essentially recognizing that you've never, you've never kind of built everything perfectly, right? You just, you know, you, you build it as best as you can. And, um, and then the, the question is, you know, is it possible to drive improvement and in, in, in almost every business, it's possible to drive improvement, but in order to do that, you need to, you need to try to really build in the metrics to understand what does today look like? And when I'm trying to drive an improvement, am I actually improving or did I maybe go in the wrong direction? And so, so you need some kind of data feedback loop. And as I said, in a, in a digital format, 
you, you're going to have usually pretty good data for that. It, some of that's becoming more challenging, particularly with some updates that Apple made recently in kind of the mobile app space. But, um, you know, I, I still think in, in the analog world of a services business, you can still, you can still drive improvement. So I, like, I even think about myself at trade shows when, when I've been in more business to business targeted, um, companies, you know, a lot of it is kind of just you know, looking at it from the customer perspective and, and thinking about that customer journey. So you're just walking up and down the aisles of the trade show and saying, okay, most people want to really highlight their brand. Is the brand going to draw anyone into my booth? You know, maybe, maybe not, but for, for most mm. companies, the brand isn't necessarily. So, so what is the, what is a short promise that someone can, can uh, process and kind of convert on in more of a billboard style um, as they're walking? And then, and then what are the, what, what are the angles that someone might appro approach the booth? What are the hooks that might bring them in there? It's like, it's really not that different from kind of a website. And then, you know, and then in that case, how do I, how do I start moving things around and, and ultimately tracking, you know, for every 10 people who walk by, only one came in. We moved some things I, I think, I think, I think it's an excellent, yeah, it's an excellent yeah. example of trade show because you're basically saying, okay, I'm not going to take the growth hacking from, awareness to actual product usage i'm going to take the growth hacking from awareness to some sort of conversion let's yeah, say yeah. a person coming to the booth and listening or on the website a lead gen or maybe even a sales but not beyond that because you're limited you know how are you going to track if the lawyer was good or not or right. you know if you, and people are can't create the, the same iterations again and again and again right so ultimately uh, you need to define you know. what your success metric is and then you need to think about different combinations of of ways that you're going to try to increase that success metric per investment you're making. So that investment might be, you know, per hour at the trade show, or it might be, you know, per content piece that I'm putting out, or it might be actually, you know, marketing dollars that are being spent. But, but ultimately, ultimately the chances that you get something perfect the first time you do it is zero. And so it starts really with this growth mindset of just essentially saying every single thing we're doing can be improved and we just need a systematic process of driving that improvement. So, um, uh, so you know, again, taking it back to digital for just one second, Bezos, um, from, from Amazon, when he, like one of the, his famous quotes is, um, our success at Amazon is measured in how many experiments we do per day, per month, per year. So it, it's it's just essentially this this process of experimentation. If you're systematic about it, um, is is really critical for uncovering opportunity and and driving improvement across the, the business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, if we're talking about systematically doing stuff, one of the things that people usually need is some sort of. A schema, some sort of a workflow, some sort of a, a diagram or a process to follow, uh, to kind of systemize in their head, how do you need to approach things in the learning mm -hmm. phase? Right. And I understand that you have a solution for that called go practice, right? Is yeah. that what it's supposed to do? Or am I a bit off? A, a little bit off. I mean, it's really what, one of the things that I learned from, from my own, um, kind of approach when I when I really looked back and said okay what how have I gotten good at this versus some of the other people who I've talked to who don't seem to under maybe understand it on the same level that I do and I think for me how I got good at this was the um, as I mentioned so many of the companies I worked on were literally customer zero companies when I went into them or very very early stage and when you yeah imagine you know if you're working for for Coca-Cola and you're, you're doing things, how do you really know cause and effect of the things that you're doing that did, did you really move the needle on driving someone to go into that 7-Eleven and buy, right. buy Coke instead of a Pepsi? It's really hard to isolate it. But when you're starting from customer zero and you have, you have a lot of data there, you can start to, to really figure out, all right, I've, I've got a lot of people in on the product, but they all disappear after using it for a couple of days. So 
why, why am I not able to grow? It's not because I can't get them in. It's because I can't keep them. Why can't I keep them? Because either they're the wrong people or I've not created something that's valuable enough to keep them. So then you start to recognize that at the core of sustainable growth, you need to have a valuable differentiated service. And mm -hmm. that's like start, that's step one. And then you also realize that the longer it takes someone to get to experience that value, the more likely they're going to give up and, and go somewhere else. And so right. speed to value becomes a really critical principle. So essentially you start to, because you have so much less noise in a super early stage company, you start to really be able to isolate the principles of, of what really matters for growth and what can I specifically do to accelerate growth in the business. And so we've really built a training program that takes someone through that same journey. And so they're literally going through a simulation of analyzing the early data of a business and then trying to figure out how do I, how do I take that early data make the changes to the core product, make the changes to the onboarding, and then, and then ultimately start to focus on customer acquisition and, and marketing and scaling that side of things. Um, but essentially they're working in, in a simulated environment. So think like a flight simulator. Mm -hmm. If I, if I learn how to fly a plane by getting behind the wheel of a plane, that's pretty dangerous. Yeah. But in a simulated environment, I can, Absolutely. I can actually, yeah, I can actually learn how to do that. And by the time I get behind the wheel of the plane, I can actually fly that plane to some degree and then get better and better over time. And so we create a simulated environment where you're actually working with real data in a, in a system called amplitude. You're seeing the information, you're making decisions and you're, you're literally, and, and we even build in the personalities, you know, the, these different people on the team don't believe that you're, what you're seeing in the data is real. And they're, they're telling you, this is the reason. And so you're, you're literally kind of navigating that, that whole process and learning through that navigation of the process. So I built this program with a former data scientist from Facebook and um, he's really good on product management and data science. And then I came at this more from the marketing direction, mm -hmm. but essentially to be good at growth today, you just have to be be good across so many different disciplines, and and it's not just be, being good at each of those disciplines individually. It's understanding how they all fit together to create sustainable growth in a business. And so that's right. really what, what what we've done with this program is is put people through that type of program. In addition to live live um, sessions with Oleg and me, an hour and a half each week, uh, where we dig deeper into. So, so would you bought. say, would you say this is something that is more for uh, people working in technical companies or anybody I would. who, yeah, okay. I, I would say that it's, it's ideal for people working in technical companies, but I would also say that um, if you have an agency, a, a marketing agency, and you want to help technical companies, then, then the, you know, I, I think it can be really important for you. So I, I would say probably a quarter of the people who go through the program are um, consultants or, or people from marketing or growth agencies, because it, it just, it, I think mm -hmm. it just trains on a level that, that is, is, is really hard to achieve any other way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're saying anybody who's, do, who's doing marketing, this is very beneficial for? For, for sure. And, and okay. yeah, I just, I think... It's I think most people are still in the kind of old world thinking around marketing of just kind of the ADA, you know, like I, I, I just need to get their awareness and, and drive that interest and, and that action and then I'll get them. But it, at the end of the day, if you, if you don't have a truly differentiated, valuable product, it, it's going to fail. And so right. it's, this is more of kind of working from that product outward and then you know, for, for me, for what it's worth, when I'm helping to grow a business, I still do that now um, these days. I don't want to help create the product because I could take a year or two years and, and, and require lots of iterations. So for me, the other thing you can get from this is really being able to set, assess, is this business at a stage where I can actually be really helpful with growth? And then, so it's, it's much more of like, figuring out, does anyone consider this product a must have? If so, who and why? And then how do I start from that? Who and why considers this a must have? 
and then build the full growth program on top of that understanding. And so that's a, a, that's that ultimately is a skill set that I, I think is still lacking in most people. And it's just because we we all build a specialty somewhere, but but to be really good, you you actually need a. a a deep enough understanding across a lot of different areas and, and most people and, just aren't approaching it that way. And and what what do you what would you say the main barriers for marketers who have a small budget and small teams? Not only agencies, but also you you've been to companies that have a small team and a small budget. Right. What's what's the main barrier and how can you crack through it? Yeah, I think a small budget is is um yeah, obviously, just about anybody would be able to get more budget if they could show that for every dollar they spend, they generate ten dollars. Like that—that's a pretty compelling right. argument to say. Let's go out. And, you know, you can raise additional money from a bank. You can raise it from venture capitalists if you could. If you could present that formula. I mean, most of us are not trying to invest marketing dollars to drive a thousand percent return on investment. But but ultimately, ultimately. Dollars either have a return, you know, marketing dollars either have a return on investment or they don't. And if you don't have a return on investment, even a small budget is probably too big. And mm -hmm. if you have a strong return on investment, you should probably have a bigger budget. So, the, so I think the barrier is really return on investment. And then the question comes down to how do you drive return on investment? How, and then how do you drive scalable return on investment? And so the, I'll give you an example from the early days that logged me in. I, I was approaching it as the VP of marketing. I was approaching it much, much like a lot of marketers do today. I just got to be creative, figure out ways to get people in the door. But I realized that uh, you know, part of it was I was I was constrained by that return on investment, and so my small budget of ten thousand dollars a month um, was was really the most that I could spend effectively. If I wanted to spend a hundred thousand dollars a month, I would have wasted 90,000 of that. And so, yeah. um, so for me, I, that's where the analysis took place where I, where I stepped back and said, why is it so hard to spend this money? And I realized that, um, you know, we, we as, as I mentioned, it was one of the first freemium services. So I was really acquiring people to a free product and then a percentage of those people would buy the paid product. And so one, there's just kind of time to get them through that cycle. But two, if they didn't actually use the free product, the chances they were going to buy the paid product was almost zero. Right. And so when I actually looked at the data, I saw that most people who signed up for the free product never actually used the free product. And so that, that the kind of system was broken. And when I, when I dug into why are they not using the free product? So doing some surveying to people who gave up, it was, it was just that, you know, it was too complex for them. It was too, too complicated to get going with it. And that was, you know, fixing that problem was outside the scope of my role as VP of marketing. We had a separate product team who would handle a lot of that, but they were focused on a long-term product roadmap. Hmm. And yeah. And so, so you had kind of this <laughs> no man's land of, I didn't have the, the, the skills or authority on my team to deal with this new customer onboarding. Right. The product team was focused on, you know, how do I keep making it better for our active users? And, but when I presented that data to our CEO, he actually said, I, you know, I was, I was hoping maybe to get a little bit of attention from the product team. He actually said, this is the number one barrier for our success as a business. And I want you to stop trying to find new marketing channels. I want the uh, product team to stop building the product and everyone come together and focus on how do we get new signups to actually use the product. And so when we put our collective energy and focus on that, we were actually able to improve our signup to usage rate by a thousand percent in three wow. months. Yeah. Wow. So we, we literally only had 5% of people who signed up using the product before we started that process. Three months later, we had 50% of people, which still means like, it still sounds bad. Half the people who signed up didn't use the No, product. no, no. That's great. That's great. You know, yeah. with SaaS companies today, some companies that are, seems to be doing very well have maybe 3% conversion on, uh, on freemium to pay, maybe 5%. Yeah, and this wasn't even on freemium to pay. This was just on signing up for free to actually using free. Using it, <laughs> right. And so, but, but what that did is it had a direct correlation to the percentage that upgraded to premium. And so now 
the my lack of creativity to be able to scale beyond that ten thousand dollars a month turned out it was less of a lack of creativity and more of just kind of a broken system. Mm-hmm. I went back and tried the exact same marketing channels, advertising channels that I so previously let, let, tested. They now scale to a million dollars a month. Let me ask you, that's amazing, but let me ask you a hard question. Let's say you would come to that CEO and the CEO would tell you, look, what can I do, Sean? You know, they're working on a roadmap. They can't, I can't devote any resource for this. Would you walk away? This podcast is brought to you by Umbrella. Have an agency? Check out UmbrellaUS.com to grow it today. Um, you, have to, you have to make that choice. Um, I, th- I think a lot of CEOs would say that. And, um, and I think in that case, I, I would, I wouldn't storm out and walk away, but I would, uh, you know, I might, I might try to collect more data, make my case over the course of another month. Um, but yeah, I, I've, I've had, I've had times where people just don't react to data. So, um, I'll, I'll give you like another example on this. So fortunately he reacted perfectly, but I had another company I was working on where I presented that data and, and I got exactly that feedback. And so mm-hmm. then I thought, okay, what I need to do is not just have the data that only, only X percent of people who, who sign up are still using a week later. Let, let, me, let me see if I, can, uh, if I can get some surveying to, to understand why and try to, try to share that with the CEO and the product team. And if we, if we can get people saying that it's too complicated and that we need to focus on that, that that'll probably be enough. So I've did a bunch of surveying, got the survey data, presented the survey data. And again, we, we, we have this long-term roadmap. We don't want to focus on that. And, and so, okay, that was frustrating. So then, then I thought, okay, one more try, and then I'm out of here. And my one more try was, okay, I'm going to isolate down to some of the people who are actually having this problem, dig into there. And then I'm going to try to get, uh, I'm going to do some user testing with some brand new people that, that, look like they have a similar profile and video the user testing of those people coming in and trying to use the product. And if I can get videos of people struggling with it, that might compel the team. And I, the, the, the first video I presented had someone cursing as it was, it was in, in the game space <laughs> and they're trying to use this golf game for the first time. And you could just hear them saying all kinds of curse words as they're trying to use it. And that was the first time that I saw the product team all sit up and say, oh my God, we need to fix this. And so, you know, data from thousands of users didn't move the needle. Survey feedback from hundreds of users didn't move the needle. One person struggling where I got video of it was what moved the needle. And so um, it's, 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 it's hard to compel it, but eventually they did. Yeah, it's probably compounded, right? It's all three, it, but it just goes to show that you're a very smart marketer because you went and you tackled your own internal problem in a three level approach and you didn't stop with data. And I think that's actually a very important lesson to people listening to this. Now, I know a lot of the agencies that we work with get, get hit by the client wall many times yeah. when they say, look, we have to come up with a USP, for example, or we have to change something that is a bit more meaningful in your branding or your business. And the client is pushing because he's saying, no, no, just do advertising. Right. And 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 at the end of the day it's the same situation so guys right. if you're listening to this this is a very smart way of not giving up try to come back again to the table with another proof and i think you know some people like you said would just react better yeah. some people don't react to data for many reasons it's hard for them to process and yeah. or believe it quote and, unquote, and, and but- it kind of hits uh it hits the the kind of logical rational side of things but but Logic and ration doesn't, you know, as, as, as marketers, we understand, like you can't, you can't compel action with logic. A lot of times emotion is what drives action and, and seeing that person struggle was, was what triggered the emotion to say, I need to solve that. And, you know, who's, who's really figured that out or the, um, you know, the, the nonprofits that are trying to solve world hunger, you know, they could, they could put all kinds of data on the screen and they were not going to raise anything. They put one starving child on the screen. Yeah. They, they tug at the heartstrings. And so like, it's, you know, it ultimately, ultimately that's, that's why I come back to experimentation. And, and when you see in that case, that was much more of a services type approach to experimentation. I was trying to drive an outcome. This didn't work. Okay. 
this didn't work. And then the third thing I tried actually did work to drive the outcome. And, and so, um, I, but I think it all starts with, you have to understand the problem before you can develop the right solution to it. And so in, in both cases, I understood the problem through the data, but how I drove the solution, um, was, was, was a bit different based on, you know, based on some experimentation. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I, I think it's an excellent lesson. Uh, probably one of the best that I heard. Uh, I, maybe I'm taking it also on the personal level in many ways, but I think uh, a lot of the people that I work with and, and train, I think it's very relevant for them to understand that, you know, try because we don't pivot when we think of our own team slash our client, yeah. which is part of our team. We, we think about it in many ways with the end client that we're trying to acquire. Okay, I'm going to pivot my marketing, I'm going to try this approach, that approach, but then internally. And internally, right. maybe, you know, it really, it's, it's a light bulb. Um, and, and for so, what it's worth, that's why I think, you know, what I said is like the test learn approach of growth hacking um, is something that marketers, particularly digital marketers have been doing for years now, but it's so difficult to push deeper beyond what, what we control as marketers in, in using that approach. And so that's why most companies that sort of stayed out on the edges and when you, when you want to actually get product teams and engineering and designers and, and all of that complexity, they're, just not, they're not used to working with data. They're not used to experimenting. They're used to being driven by their creative intuition and deep understanding of customer needs. But um, yeah, that's just, it, as we know as marketers that it's very unpredictable how people are going to respond to something. So you need to, you need to try a lot of different things. Right, right. Uh, there is something that I want to ask you, you give, you give advice to a lot of companies, um, in a lot of companies, a lot of different companies, a lot of different people in many, many ways. Was there an advice given to you that is really memorable and you really took it hard and made some sort of change? Something you probably, remember, I mean. Yeah, probably the best advice that, that I, I got was from, you know, so, so I mentioned those first two companies I worked on, I had the same CEO through those, through those companies. And, um, he, he very early on said, um, you know, he, he would, he would tell me to do stuff and I would say, okay, yeah, I'll go and do that. And he's like, I don't want you to ever not walk around with a piece of paper or a pad of paper and a pen. When I tell you to do this, I want to see you write it down. And so it's, weird, but like I, I literally, I almost <laughs> never don't have, you know, pen and paper in my hand. And so obviously, you know, you have a phone today where you can take notes into the phone. Um, yeah. but it still takes too much time to get going where, where a pen to paper, it's just, it's, it's fast. And so it's, it's kind of weird advice, but that's, that's some advice that, um, you know, and, and then no, I think no, at the same, yeah, at the same time, it, it, he, it was he was always like, know your numbers as well. And so that, that kind of got me, that got me, you know, he, it got me something where, you know, for a long time, my reaction when he would ask a question is I'll go get that for you. And I could tell he, he just responded so much better when I actually said, uh, yeah, the answer is, uh, 27% or whatever it was. So I would, I would then always try to anticipate what is his next question going to be and just like be two steps ahead so that I, in that pad of paper where I took all my notes, I would have, I would have the data there so that I, I could show that. Yes. I've also figured, <laughs> I've also thought of that question and have the answer. Yeah. Yeah. So, but how, okay. That's, that does require a lot of, you need to really work very close with that person, right? To kind of get in under the skin and know what they're going to ask and well, be prepared I, for that. Or it requires actually you to be more curious than your boss about the areas you're responsible for. That's good advice. Yeah. That I like. Okay, that's great. So it, it became less about trying to please him and more about if this is my area of responsibility and he's asking a question that's important that I haven't asked, I'm doing something wrong. That's, I love that. That's excellent. Because we always, we always also, we talk about when you go and talk with a client, think about how you can make them a hundred thousand dollars. So you can make $10,000, not the other way around. Don't right, come right. into a conversation thinking what you could take. So I think it's the same approach and it's, it's very smart. So, uh, 
we have one last section. It's short. Sure. Uh, and it's a rapid Q&A. It's, I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions and you need to answer short and fast. Uh, if you feel some are too personal, you can say pass. Pass. Okay. They're, not, they're not super. No, no, they're not. I only super have three early. passes. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, that's I'm good. Dude, not, not, so many, not so many questions. Uh, ready? Yeah, sure. Uh, did you get along with your parents growing up? Most of the time. Do you have siblings? Yes. How many? Two. Two Do sisters. Do you have a pet? Two sisters. Yeah. Do you have a pet? Yep. Two dogs. What? How old were you when your first kid was born? I was 27. When do you wake up? Uh, this morning at 5 a.m. to go surfing. But nice. Mo most days, 7 a.m. When do you go to bed? Uh, usually 10 p.m. Ideal vacation? Uh, just booked a trip to Costa Rica and Nicaragua. That's, that's pretty good for me. <laughs> Surfing, right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Are you a man of faith? Uh, I would say um, not necessarily religious faith, but, but just faith in general, yes. Spirituality, yes. Okay. Okay. Excellent. So, Sean, it's been great. I, excellent advice. And I think what you're doing is super interesting. Um, this remind me that your, your podcast is the breakout growth podcast, right? That's right. where people can listen to more ideas about pod, about growth hacking and yeah, how you well, implement it. No, specifically what I'm doing on that podcast is I'm, I'm looking at external data to find the fastest growing kind of emerging companies and, I'm talking to either the head of growth, head of product, head of marketing, or the CEO founder to really try to get to the heart of what's driving their growth. And so recently, That's super interesting. yeah, recently interviewed the head of product at Canva, who just, you know, Australia based company that just announced a $15 billion valuation and being able to just dig into, and, and she was formerly head of growth. And so now she's head of product. So you see this convergence of, of yeah. product leads and growth leads. Um, but then I also spoke to the founder president of Noom um, a couple of interviews ago and, uh, and just really kind of uncovering the counterintuitive things. Like they have a 60 step customer onboarding in their app for weight loss. And so you, the, you know, I, I, as I talked about speed to value as being a really important principle, right? 60 steps of onboarding in a mobile app sounds wow. ridiculous, but it's, it, they've, they've tested their way into it. They've iterated their way into it. And now they're, they're doing, you know, upwards of $500 million in revenue in, in the weight loss space, taking on companies that have been really successful in the weight loss space for a long time. And, um, so yeah, it's uh, it, it, to to me, it's just really interesting to to try to particularly to try to try to learn the things that they're doing that I wouldn't have thought of, and uh, so it's kind of a pet project. But um, I I think for anyone listening, it's it's just really good to be able to actually try to try to get to the heart of how really fast growing companies are doing it. I'm definitely going to subscribe to that. I, I played with Gnome a little bit. I saw their onboarding process. Um, they have in those 60 steps, they, they, they take breaks. Like they yeah. have a little, okay, I'm going to give you some results. And then they take away. It's very yeah, smart. Yeah, yeah. I like it as well. I'm definitely going to subscribe. I love these things. Um, and you're I, I watched my, I watched my wife go through the onboarding for, for Noom and, and I could just see like, excitement as she oh now they're saying that i'm gonna hit my weight my weight goal um one month earlier because of these things yeah that I'm exactly so, yeah there's this like excitement and uh and i'm seeing that i'm, I'm thinking smart smart right, right. that's 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 yeah and i and then on the you know to, to side note i i lost 20 pounds with noom um from january of this year till now to get to my lowest weight in over a decade and, and wow. uh, yeah, I mean, so I, I'm, you know, and eating, eating fruits and, you know, not, not doing something where it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're only doing proteins and no carbs, but it, you know, but it, but it's something that feels really sustainable and, and, you know, clean, healthy foods, but not feeling hungry. Like, so I, that, that's an example of a product that really works. And then 
a, a unique growth engine that feeds that product. And, and we saw the same thing with the Canva interview. And so you, you start to just really see these patterns. And so I think, I think, you know, for me, the biggest thing I learned is that as a, as a marketer, I'm only as good as the product can be in uniquely satisfying that need. And, and to be successful, I need to, I need to really get to the heart of why, why is that product so uniquely good for certain people? And, and, and that's, that's, that's kind of the process I try to go through to then build a growth machine on getting the right people to the right experience in that product. Definitely. Definitely. So Sean, it's been great. I'm going to subscribe to the breakout growth podcast. And I, I, I want to thank you very much for being with us. And I'm sure all the listeners are thanking you as well. I appreciate and it. uh, it's been fun, fun chatting with you. Fun chatting with you as well. Uh, you, you have a great day. You too, Sean. Bye. Thank you for tuning into another episode of the Marketing Umbrella Podcast, where we provide the information you need from successful leading marketers to build and grow your digital marketing agency. Your host has been Inamar Shafir, founder and CEO of Umbrella, the technology platform and brand that is powering thousands of marketing agencies around the country. Find him at UmbrellaUS.com.